part of the Press Play Podcast Network. And welcome to another Red Guy and Rota podcast here on the Press Play Podcast Network. And a shout out, as always, to our leadoff man, the man, the myth, the legend, the one who gets it done for you out in the podcastosphere. Ty Courts, our outstanding producer. Thank you, Ty, for making all this happen. And Michael Red Guy, how about that, man? One preseason game in the books, two more to go. And before you know it, September 8th will be here, and the Browns will be hosting the Cowboys for real, man. Football season is upon us. Can't wait, Kenny. Best time of the year. Um, You know, I think I've uh, certainly expressed that many times uh, in the past here on Hour and Hour. So, uh, yeah, I'm starting to feel the uh, the pads are popping and uh, the helmets are popping, too. And we're just about ready to go. And there's some interesting things, I would say, have, uh, you know, been on display here early on with the Browns. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, unfortunately, too many things off the field, right, Reg? Oh, I mean, yeah, well, the- yeah. I wasn't yeah, that. That wasn't uh, one of the interesting things, but uh, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, know, I, it is. Yeah, well, yeah, 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 and if this goes down the way it's been reported, yeah, it's gonna be a world of hurt for uh, Michael. Yeah, we're talking about Michael Hall's second-round pick for the Cleveland Browns out of the Ohio State. The headline on ESPN.com right now, Browns Hall threatens woman with gun. That woman is fiancé. Domestic situation uh, uh, in Avon, arrested. Um, And the Browns released a statement uh, basically not saying much other than they're looking into it and they can't say anything more. So at this point, uh, we don't know what the future holds. Uh, immediate or long-term future for Mike Hall Jr. with the Browns, innocent until proven guilty, but does not look good from uh, you know what we've been reading. So that's a distraction off the field, Michael. And then another Ohio State player, Luke Whipler, in the preseason loss, twenty-three to ten to Green Bay, breaks his ankle. Looks like he's done for the year. Um, even though they haven't said that yet, Reg, I think the fact that they went out and traded for Nick Harris. With Seattle giving up a sixth round pick uh, in 2026 tells me that uh, Whipler is probably done for the year and they wanted to, you know, bring in a guy that uh, was experienced with this team and could be the backup center. I think you're spot on with that. And uh, so, uh, uh, again, as we know, and and look, that offensive line, it's, it's one of the strongholds of this organization. And I think many feel like it is uh, right there with the top position groups on this football team and and yeah they need the, they need those top hands on deck Kenny so we're going to have to see how this plays out but uh, yeah you don't like seeing whether it's injury situations or even worse off the field situations uh, cause issues in August before you uh, get rolling in September so um Going to have to see how it all plays out. But, you know, when somebody goes down, that that gives an opportunity for another, right? That's what the NFL is all about. So we'll see if this, um, if this depth that the Browns have been trying to uh, put together can withstand these type of things. Reg, how much uh, did you watch of the preseason game? Uh, because uh, I watched a couple of things. I watched... Cade York kicking off for the new kickoff rule, and he put it in the end zone the two times I watched it, so there was no return. I watched him hit a 55-yard field goal, and uh, that was about it because I was tuned into the Olympic men's basketball game at the same time watching the USA and France play. So how much did you uh, actually see from the preseason game against Green Bay? Not much more than you just described. A little bit. I've got it taped. Haven't gotten to it as of yet. But do intend to do that, and uh, so um, you know. I've uh, been told we didn't miss anything, Michael. <laughs> uh, yeah, me too. Um, and I, I, I take the word of uh, my son, Cal Regai. He's usually yeah. pretty good with that. And he said, "Dad, I, I couldn't even watch it. It was that much not like an NFL game." So, yeah. um, which I'm sure that's probably accurate, and uh, we'll see. We'll see where this goes. But, um, Kenny, it sounds like that Kevin Stefanski has intimated that 
as the next couple of weeks go on, there's going to be more of the ones, right, the first teamers that start to uh, get some playing time. It won't be a lot. And, of course, we already know that uh, they've already penciled in Deshaun Watson to play, and I think at least a half in that final preseason game. And uh, Ken, honestly, I mean, uh, the, 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 well, you and I have talked about this. I mean, this is the biggest thing uh, going. I mean, the Browns are going to need a uh, a real uh, outstanding Deshaun Watson and his capabilities need to uh, – you know, step up and and be there for this football team. So um, uh, they know what they want to do with this veteran in terms of, uh, you know, how much work they give him. So obviously they feel like playing maybe a half, right, in that last preseason game is going to – and then the, the ensuing uh, 10 days uh, to work on the practice field will have him and their offense ready, and uh, so we'll go with that. Uh, and hope that that is uh, that's accurate the way the Browns are assessing this. In listening to Kevin Stefanski speak uh, over the last few days, we're taping this on a Tuesday night, which means uh, the next day, Wednesday and Thursday, they will be practicing, scrimmaging, working against however you want to say it, the Minnesota Vikings. And reportedly, Watson will get uh, a lot of the first team reps there, and that's why he won't play Saturday in the preseason game at home against Minnesota, but then will play in that final um, you know, game against Seattle on the right. road before right. they get ready for uh, Dallas. So they must figure that the work uh, over two days in practice far more important than the actual game itself because they can script what they want to do in these practices and then put him out there for at least – uh, a quarter against Seattle in that final one. Yeah, Kenny, we're we're seeing more and more in the last couple of years. This is how uh, almost every NFL organization goes about getting their quarterbacks ready, right? Yep. Um, as you just mentioned, they have. There'll always be a a couple of um, you know a full go padded uh, scrimmages against another uh, NFL squad. In the Browns' case, as Kenny said. It's Minnesota, and yeah, you would imagine that uh, Deshaun Watson and the ones and the twos will be getting uh, plenty of work in these. Um, uh, and yeah, you can't script everything, and so you script it the way you want it. Each team try has to, uh, you know, come out with uh, how they want to approach this and what kind of work they want to get in, and how much work for uh, the various position groups. So, yeah. I think we're gonna we're gonna find out a little bit more about uh, the Browns offensively. Although, you know, I mean, we're not gonna see Nick Chubb um, in any of this. So, you know, it's gonna be a lot of the uh, the younger running backs that uh, you know we have. We that well, actually, we started to see three of them last year, didn't we, Kenny? Yeah, yeah. And I had a chance to talk with Jerome Ford when I was out at Brown's training camp. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he seems ready for the challenge of being that starting running back on September 8th against the Cowboys. Uh, last year, Reg, he was thrown into the starting job, right? After yeah. what, two weeks, I think it was. Chubb goes down uh, on that horrible, uh, you know, tackle. I, I thought it was dirty. But, uh, anyways, from Mika Fitzpatrick of the Steelers. And then uh, Ford is forced to start. Now, at least he knows he's preparing to be the starter, right? And, and so, uh, according to what he told me, he prepared for that in the offseason, knowing that, and uh, is looking forward to the challenge until uh, Chubb comes back, whenever that might be, hopefully sooner rather than later. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, Jerome Ford and uh, Pierre Strong Jr. and uh, Deontay Foreman, the. Uh... <laughs> The former Oregon Duck in the college days will uh, be the three that uh, do the bulk of the the ball carrying and running the football for the Browns. So, yeah, we'll find out. I, I mean, I know we know the Browns think very uh, highly they, of both Ford and Strong, and uh, so they're going to get opportunities to uh, make sure that they're the guys that can – Give this run game a boost, Kenny. I mean, you got to be able to run the football, right? We can talk all we want about uh, the aerial circuses around the NFL and what have you, but uh, the best teams do what offensively? They can run the football when they need to. So, you know, we'll see if that's going to be a thing for this uh, this Browns offense. 
For me, Rich, I, I think the run game is going to uh, be less of a staple this year than in years past. I, I think with the what they feel is their strongest receiving core in quite some time and the emergence of David and Joku and a healthy Deshaun Watson, I, I look for this to be a 65-35 uh, breakdown as far as percentage from pass to run this year. I don't think they traded for Deshaun Watson to run the football, especially with Nick Chubb out. Maybe it changes if he comes back. Uh, but uh, I, I look for them to sling the ball all over the field now that we know Stefanski's calling plays and Dorsey is more of the uh, quarterback coach and uh, uh, game day coordinator, helper, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, with Stefanski. So, uh, yes, they need to run it and be able to pick up uh, short yardage situations and first downs. But uh, I'll be surprised if we don't see a, a 65 to 35 percentage rate uh, throw to pass this year. And it makes sense, Ken, the way that uh, you have depicted that because, again, I uh, they believe that uh, they have, with Deshaun Watson at the wheel of it, yep. and with the receiving core they've put together, I think they feel pretty good about that. And that that is going to be uh, the uh, the bellwether of what they want to do offensively. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. And... Um, it's something that, uh, again, I mean, it's going to have to be. It's going to have to be uh, special, and it's going to have to be something that uh, Deshaun Watson is feeling real good about and comfortable about and uh, because that's the way the Browns offensively are going to put points on the board and win football games. Do you feel as confident about their receiving core as they seem to feel? Uh yeah, listen, I'm I'm always willing to give young players uh, their opportunity, right? Yep. And um I think uh you know, last year you'd have to say that uh, that that turned into a, a disappointment for Elijah Moore, right? Yep. Um Amari Cooper, um uh, you know, to me he's one of the better twos, you know, in the jargon of of uh, what NFL receivers are. Uh, these guys uh, are the ones, and these I, I think he's that. Now, on this football team, he's he's the one, right? Yes. He, yep. He's the guy. And don't get me wrong, I like Amari. I think that, but, but Kenny, he, uh, he's a very, very strong receiver. I don't think he's what you call a game-breaker or a guy that is uh, going to uh, – uh, get behind secondaries and catch the deep ball a lot. Uh, on occasion, on occasion he will. But I, I do think that you just mentioned his name. I do think David Ajoku has become um, a real key to what the Browns are going to be able to do with the pass game. And Kenny, I mean, if you put uh, if you put their uh, their face to the fire, I mean, uh, they might actually think, although he is a tight end, they internally, I have a feeling they think that he's the guy that uh, leads their receiving core and is their number one weapon there. Yeah, he and Cooper are the go-to guys. We're looking for the compliments to those guys, right, Reg? You're yes. hoping that Elijah Moore emerges. You're hoping that... Uh, Jerry Judy coming over from the Broncos uh, is worth the $56 million uh, that they ponied up and paid him. You're, you're hoping that maybe finally a, a third round draft pick at wide receiver in Cedric Tillman might pan out, uh, you know, for, for the Browns. So for me, that's an area I will be watching. And that's why it was interesting to see the Browns being mentioned in the Brandon Ayuk situation with San Francisco reportedly Browns, Patriots, Steelers, uh, the three teams that were heavily um, interested and in conversations with San Francisco talking about a trade. But as we tape this, Ayuk is still a member uh, of the 49ers. W would you be surprised if, uh, you know, you know, as this preseason goes along, maybe that changes uh, and uh, the, the Browns make another push for him, or or what? What do you think no, about that? I don't think so. I, I, I think they're committed to go with what they have, and you mentioned I think they feel that Cedric Tillman is going to make strides this year. 
Okay. You know, big receiver, Ken, a guy who can, uh, you know, catch balls in traffic and, uh, and a tight window and use that body. I don't think David Bell is going to make the football team. Wow. Third I, round uh, pick and missed yeah, the top college receiver coming out that year as far as I one understand. of those awards, right? I understand. But uh, that's a couple years ago, right? Yeah. And I don't think they see him as a uh, – I mean, you want him to at least be, I get a third round guy. My guy, probably you'd want him to be capable of being your two, but right. certainly your three. Yeah. Right? And I think Elijah Moore is, uh, is got that role. And, and can I be, a, Hey, I hope I'm wrong. I'm, I'm a little concerned about, uh, about Jerry Judy and what he is capable of delivering and how he's going to function in this offense. And I hope, I hope I can say, boy, I was wrong about that. And now that's a real moot point. Um, I don't know. I've just never been a, uh, you know, a real big, uh, I guess, uh, one who feels that, that, that he's that kind of guy. And again, I hope he proves me wrong because the Browns have, uh, have got him there uh, to me. He, he's more of a three and, uh, you know, you know, threes are what they are. You, you know, you, you, you look to get a few catches a game from them and, uh, but we'll see now. Can he be a guy that, uh, can he get you, get you, uh, I mean, and be at least a red zone guy, Kenny, that maybe is, uh, is worthy of six to eight touchdown catches? You tell me. You think so? I, I'm not a I'm I not a big questions. Judy fan. fan. I, oh, I so was, we're like this. Yes. Oh, and yeah, you and absolutely. I didn't talk about this either. Nope. Nope. I wasn't aware that you kind of uh, feel the same way I do. So um, again, he's going to have to he's going to have to prove it to all of us. And um, and again, you're going to want at least. I mean, again, if he's going to play 17 games, Kenny. Uh, I want in that 55 to 65 catches and six to eight touchdowns. Is and that, I, is that I don't have confidence. I don't have the confidence that he can do that. I, no, I, I hear it. you, but uh, yeah, but so it worries. Is me. that unreasonable for us to expect? No, and the guy I don't that you're so. saying is is your number two behind no, Amari Cooper. I, I don't think that's unreasonable at all. I I was shocked when they gave him guaranteed money and the money that they gave him. Prove me wrong. Happy yeah. to eat, you know, happy yeah. to eat uh, my words and that. Me too. Um, yeah. But I, I just don't see it. But hey, here here's what concerns me. And I, I might have mentioned this the last time we got together. I understood giving Stefanski the uh, contract extension. I didn't understand giving it to um, Andrew Barry because mm. to me, he's going to sink or swim with the Deshaun Watson trade, right? So I would have waited until after this season to see if Watson, uh, you know, reaches the level uh, they expect him to. And then when, Jer you know, they bring in Jerry Judy in a trade, I, I get it. They didn't give up much to get him. And they're trying to, you know, beat the system by uh, thinking what they're paying him now in a few years will be peanuts, but he's got to live up to it on the field. And I just don't know if he can do it. So uh, that's, uh, I'm looking at Watson and I'm looking at Judy and I'm looking at my guy, Jed Will. Those are my three biggest concerns on this football team right now. Watson, Judy, and, and Jed Wills at left tackle. That's fair. The, the, that's legitimate. Uh, I'm with you. I'm not a uh, a major Jed Wills uh, aficionado either. And again, I mean, if these guys prove us wrong, beautiful. Yep. Beautiful. Then that means Browns are right in their assessments. Reggae and Rhoda are incorrect. And these guys are going to be uh, players that, uh, with a cause, do things that uh, make this Cleveland Browns football team closer to championship material. Period. I mean, that's the thing. So, um, But they're going to have to go out and prove it, all of them. And it starts with Deshaun Watson. No question about that. I mean, he has got to. Kenny, he's just got to have a a strong championship level quarterback play year. I mean, there's no other way around it. 
they will go, and I know they're going to rely on their defense a lot, and uh, they hopefully have figured out the bugaboos uh, on the road versus at home this offseason with Jim Schwartz and everything, but they will go as far as Deshaun Watson takes them this year. End of story. Uh, yep. Miles Garrett, Defensive Player of the Year. Denzel Ward, one of the top cover corners out there. They, they like JOK emerging as a linebacker. So do I. I. I think that's all great, but they're only going to go as far as Deshaun Watson takes them. So, again, I I think this uh, Andrew Mary's sitting on a seat. Uh, it may not be warm because he's got a guaranteed contract and, mm -hmm. and uh, just re-signed one, Reg, right, uh, with an extension. But uh, if this thing goes uh, south uh, in a hurry and Watson's the reason why, mm -hmm. I don't think Jimmy Haslam will hesitate to uh, fire Andrew Barry and pay him what he owes him and hire somebody else because uh, money seems to be no object for Jimmy Haslam. Yeah, don't want it to come to that, but uh, right. that pretty much is uh, the whole thing in a nutshell here. And 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 look, yes, we know we most of us feel good about that. The Browns have a uh, a a solid to strong defensive unit, and that's all well and good. And uh, yeah, boy, do you want that? Yeah, you want that. But Ken, I think we can agree in this day and age, man. The NFL is about. An offensive quarterback receiver driven game now. Yep. So uh, I don't care how damn good your defense is going to be. Because no. as we found out last year, and yes, the Browns at, at least, we say top 10 defense in the NFL. All the yep. numbers suggest that. Well, yep. I, we can go back to uh, you know how many how many games they went. To, I I remember four offhand where the other team put up over thirty on them. And, and again, I'm not I'm not uh, you know ripping them about that. What I'm pointing out is this is an offense. This this league now, Ken, is as quarterback centric and receiver centric as it's ever been. And if you don't have that. I don't care how good your defense is. You aren't winning anything significant. And I'll stand by that. You aren't. Yeah, you want your defense. Of course you do. Who wouldn't? But defense in this, in this era of the NFL, they're not winning football games now. That's not what wins you football games. It isn't. Because the offenses are, uh, are just too elite. And um, that's just the way it is. So the Browns are going to have to need to take a step on that side of the football. Well, as long as Patrick Mahomes is in the AFC, Reg, mm -hmm. that's the team you've got to beat right now. And he's showing no signs of slowing down, and they're trying to do something nobody's ever done in the history uh, you know, of the NFL right. and the Super Bowl era, and that's win three Super Bowls in a row. And that's I right. put yeah. I put money down on them right after they won the last Super Bowl that they're going to do that because until they get beat, I'm betting on Patrick Mahomes. The only way they don't win is if he doesn't play. So if he stays healthy, I still think they, uh, with what they did this offseason too to bolster their offense, mm -hmm. uh, I, I still think they're the favorites to win it all. They have to be. Yeah, yeah. No, to not think that. I just, uh, <laughs> uh, I think you're not looking at things the with the reality attached to yep. it. So, you know, are they a guarantee? No, they're not a guarantee. But um, they're the best football team uh, in in the NFL, the way I see it. And so, you, yeah, I mean, you play in their conference, you're going to have to at some point show – that you can beat them. And of course, you know, we're not, uh, look to me, um, Brown's got to show, be able to, that they can in their own division, get by the Baltimore Ravens too. So, uh, you know, that they'll play twice, right? Yep. So, uh, yeah, it, this is something that, um, is going to have to grow and uh, get to the point. And again, I mean, without, Without tremendous play from Deshaun Watson, I it's not going to happen. And it Reg, just ain't going to happen. They they need to jump out early because I just looked at their schedule and their final four games yeah. are Chiefs at home at Cincinnati, Dolphins at home at Baltimore to close out the regular season. So that's uh, a rough they, stretch, isn't it? It is. It is a rough. Whereas, and we're going to get to the Guardians after the break. They play 13 of their last 16 at home to close out the regular season. So advantage mm -hmm. Cleveland Guardians, one of the best home records in baseball. Hey, Browns last year, I think were eight and one. They had the nine games at home, right? So they've done well at home. 
Yep. Uh, but they, two of the games that, at home to close it out are Chiefs and Dolphins, who were considered Super Bowl contenders. And then you're on the road at Baltimore and, and uh, Cincinnati as well. So, uh, this hey, it all gets started September 8th against the Cowboys at 425 p.m. And, uh, you know, we'll see in Tom Brady's first game calling uh, uh, NFL action as an yeah. analyst. Uh, we'll see how the Browns do uh, and maybe set the table for the entire season. Yeah, well, Brady will be there then. Usually the analysts go in uh, sometimes Wednesday, but for sure Thursday. Yeah. See the uh, the last strong practice week on Thursday. Friday's a little bit, uh, you know, uh, not quite as, uh, as heavy a workload. However, I mean, Brady will be there. Maybe he can... Uh, Rain some of his uh, expertise <laughs> from the quarterback position and take a look at this, uh, the Browns offense and uh, give some good encouragement words to, uh, to uh, Deshaun Watson. We'll see. But um, Kenny, I, I'm really looking forward to it because expectations are high, right? And uh, now we're going to see if, uh, you know, as you said, and you're so right about, I mean, this is Andrew Barry's baby, huh? I mean, this is, this is what he's put together. Uh, so uh, we're going to find out. And uh, Kenny, uh, to me, I, I think, I think we talked about this. I think they're going to need to uh, hit that 11 win plateau to uh, be where they want to be. I'm with you 100% on that, Reg. All right, let's do this. Let's jump into our uh, first break here of the r r podcast. And when we come back, let's talk some Cleveland Guardians who were victorious tonight while we are taping this podcast as they, hey, they beat the Cubbies for the second straight night, two to one. So we're going to talk Guardians, Cubs, Guardians, AL Central race. John Kenzie Noel, Emmanuel Classe, and dare I say, maybe some help in the starting rotation from a Matthew Boyd. How'd he do? We'll tell you when we return on the RR podcast here on the Press Play Podcast Network. What's up, everyone? I'm Holly Wetzel. And I'm Tyvis Powell. And we are your hosts of the Orange is Oranger, a Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. We give you all the dog pound coverage that you'll need to get you through the regular season. Hopeful postseason, and I'd say off-season, Tyvis, but is there really ever an off-season for this team? Thankfully for our podcast, Holly, there really never is when it comes to the Cleveland Browns. Don't miss our breakdown of each week's matchup, game recaps, and any and all news out of Berea to feed your Browns appetite. As we know, Holly, dogs gotta eat. Yes, they do. So hit that subscribe button and never miss an episode of the Orange is Orange Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. Hey, everybody, it's Sam Amico from Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Be sure to give us a listen for all your Cleveland Cavaliers recaps, analysis, breakdowns, draft talk, free agency. The list goes on and on. Give us a listen, Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Looking for new insights on the Cleveland sports scene with a unique side of Cleveland sports history? Then you found the perfect podcast. I'm John Sable. And I'm Scott Sable, and we're hosts of the Sable Brothers on the Baseline podcast, a podcast about Cleveland sports, but not your typical podcast about the land's sports teams. Join us as we embark on a journey of sharing a unique and historical side of Cleveland sports history with the help of some former Cleveland sports stars and other historical figures. All right here on the Sable Brothers on the Baseline podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. And we continue with the r r Podcast here on the Press Play Podcast Network. And Michael Redguy, uh, JT and I, Kenny and JT Show, News Talk 1480 WHBC, Monday through Friday, 3 to 7. We go down to the ballpark at least twice a month, all right? Mm -hmm. We do a, a, a pre-pregame, as we like to call it. We get to sit up in the press box, watch BP, uh, talk to some of the, the Guardians people uh, and uh, analysts and whatnot. And so we were down there, uh, we're taping this on a Tuesday. We were down there yesterday uh, as they took on the Cubs, won that game 9-8 to eight as we're taping this. They win against the Cubs tonight 2-1. to one. The big story tonight, and, and the one thing I wanted to, to see how he would do, was Matthew Boyd, starting pitcher that they signed as a free agent at the end of uh, June, I think it was. He is coming off Tommy John surgery 14 months ago. 
and he made his debut for the Guardians tonight and went five and a third innings, three hits, one earned run, six strikeouts, no walks, 80 pitches, 61 strikes, Michael Regai. And Mm. uh, you're familiar with him uh, as a former Tiger. Uh, Matthew Boyd, an experienced pitcher. Hey, is this literally a shot in the arm that the, the Guardians needed that maybe could help that rotation moving forward? Well, it really is. I mean, again, uh, many thought Matthew Boyd's best years are behind him, Kenny. But, uh, I mean, this kind of performance, I mean, that goes to show you what a, a, a veteran guy that's been through this before has, is able to offer. And, man, if Boyd can uh, stick with those type of performances, I mean, probably, Kenny, you know how, uh, anyway, Stephen Vogt and uh, – Carl Willis Wannies, you know, they want him to go six innings, right. six strong, right? Give me yep. six strong. And then we'll turn it over to the bully after that. And that's exactly what he, well, five and a third, but that's exactly what he did tonight. And he's missing bats, Kenny, like you said, with those six Ks. So a uh, very, very strong performance. And I have to believe that, uh, there are a lot of smiles and a lot of, uh, yeah, we told you so's about getting Matthew Boyd and now having him as a part of this this uh, Guardian starting rotation uh, could be just the uh, just the need that gets filled for um, the uh, the Guardians got to have that you got to have strong starting outings uh, in August and September and October huh we know that if you're going to be playing for something meaningful and uh so the first one from Boyd uh, checked all the boxes in a good way, Ken. It did, whereas Alex Cobb, who they traded for, and was coming off uh, a surgery from a year ago, but it was uh-huh. on his hip and had a blister on his finger. Four and two-thirds, nine hits, four earned runs. Not a great first outing for him. He's a little older. He's 36. Boyd's mm-hmm. 33. So Cobb will go on uh, Wednesday night to wrap up this Cub series uh, at home. Uh, I'm just hoping for one of those two Reds, right? You got Tanner Bybee. Ben Lively has not been good his last couple of starts, um, but he's got 10 wins for you, and he's been a great find uh, this entire season. But if at least one of these two, Boyd or Cobb, can be a regular starter in that top three of that rotation, then that's going to better their chances of holding on and winning the AL Central and maybe doing some damage in the postseason. I I can't see them going into the postseason with Bybee and Lively as their only two legitimate starters and expecting them to go far, Reg. I I need Boyd or Cobb, ideally both, okay, uh, to come through for them. But uh, give me one or the other, and I'll be happy with that. That's right. And make no mistake, that's exactly why these uh, two guys are here, right? Because it gives a veteran presence and guys that have been through this before, as we just said. Because, um, you know, pitching uh, in uh, September when the leaves start to fall and then hopefully in October – uh, especially if uh, your team that's playing for something, i.e., getting in the playoffs, well, that is a, that's a different dog. And these two guys, you know, I I feel good about it, Ken. I think they've done a very nice job in in getting both of them. And with Boyd's performance tonight, um, and you mentioned Cobb from the other evening, I, you know, these guys. Hell, Kenny, we could get into October, and these guys could be, could be one, two. Yeah, and and the other guy that I forgot to mention, there are probably people out there listening to this podcast. Hey, Rhoda, you're an idiot. What about Gavin Williams? Well, that's another guy, too. Uh, And and here's the. Here's the thing with Gavin. Now, his last outing was outstanding. Pitched well in Minnesota when they needed him to pitch well, right? Yeah. Uh, And the thing I like about it, if the elbow isn't barking anymore, if the elbow is fine after getting that shot in there, right, he's going to have a fresh arm, Reg. It's kind of like when Kyrie came back to help the Cavs in 2016, right? He he had fresh legs for the playoffs. Well, uh, maybe a fresh arm in Gavin Williams to go along with Boyd and Cobb, and then you mix in Bybee and uh, Lively, Lively, one of those yeah. two. So mm-hmm. now you've got some options here as opposed to uh, before when you were calling up everybody and anybody, uh, you know, Xavion Curry and Carla. I 
hey, Carlos Carrasco was terrible. How the hell is he still on the roster? I don't get it, red guy. I just don't. I'm I with mean, you, Harry. Yeah, so I uh, I don't think he's on the roster anymore. So that's good, Harry. So, um, but. Yeah, so you've got options now with Gavin, hopefully healthy and ready to go for the stretch run. Uh, Bybee uh, has been solid all year. And then Cobb, Boyd, and Lively, you've got Might five be guys to pick from now. There you go. And as we know, maybe a manager we could. We've seen it before. Yeah, Maybe when you reach October, he said, we're going with three starters. And then these two guys that have been starters are going to be the first guys out of the bully if we need it early, right? We've seen that many times before. So I'm not insinuating that that's the way Stephen Boat's going to go, but, you know, could be. Right. I don't think there'll be five starters. So right. uh, the four at the most, and it might be three. So we'll we'll see how all that plays out. But at least one or two of these guys, Kenny, are going to do their work in October on the bullpen. Guarantee you that. By the way, Carrasco on the 15-day DL <clears throat> with uh, a hip injury. Uh, okay, oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah mm. that's that's what they're saying. So uh, there you that, go. They put him on today, huh? I didn't uh, see that uh, four days ago. Actually, oh, was it four days ago? I, <laughs> I didn't know either. Show you. I just uh, yeah. yeah. I, I just uh, read it myself, so um, uh, I thought he went on there for whiplash, but um, uh, they're uh, saying okay. it's, it's a, a <laughs> hip strain. So, okay. But, hey, I'll say this about Carlos Carrasco. Takes, the ball, think, takes he, the ball every five there days, you go. right? He but gave you that, innings, if nothing yeah. else, this year when you needed it with all the injuries. So, in fair, you know, in fairness to him, uh, he gave you that, which is good. Hey, how about Emmanuel Claus tonight? Fourth game in a row that Voter used him, uh, and he picks up save number 37 tonight, Reg, for this team. Yeah, well, evidently, he probably, and again, you know, there, there's nobody on a, a good baseball team that the skippers talk to more than their closer. Right? Uh, can you go tonight? You done to it? Can you go a third night in a row? Can you go a fourth night in a row if I need you? How about that? Right. And um, so evidently, Emmanuel Classe said, uh, "I'm ready, Skip. Let me let me tell tell me when uh, tell me when you want me to get up and get loose. Eighth inning, ninth inning, and uh, four games in a row now." So, uh, hey, look, they, I think the guy is is showing how durable he is. He's one of the best in the game. And I think all Indians fans, probably a Guardians fan, excuse me, got to agree that uh, you feel good when you see him coming in with a one or two run lead late innings, huh? Yeah, absolutely. They'll probably give him the day off tomorrow because there's an off day then as well. Uh, followed up on Thursday before they head to Milwaukee and then New York against the Yankees. So uh, you win the first two, so you win the series. Somebody else can have to show. Hopefully, hopefully you don't need a closer uh, tomorrow night, and uh, it's a big enough lead where you don't, uh, you know, aren't mm -hmm. winning a one-run game like these last two against the Cubs. So uh, we'll see. And what about John Kenzie Noel? Big How Christmas. About that? Hitting his ninth home run tonight, a 430-foot blast. Uh, and uh, that's three home runs in the last two days for the guy they call Big Christmas. Uh, and, and he's letting uh, voter know, hey, you might have traded for Lane Thomas, but don't forget about me out there. I got more home runs than Lane Thomas does. That's right. It has not been a good Guardians beginning for Lane Ooh. Thomas. Uh, I I'm not. Was he in the lineup tonight? No, it was. Uh, I don't believe righty, he was. It was a righty uh, pitcher, so uh, yeah, uh, they they did not start him. Uh, he's batting yeah. a buck twenty nine since being mm -hmm. acquired in thirteen. Hell, you know it's bad. Okay, Reg, you know it's bad when Austin Hedges has a higher batting average than you do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he's at like 162 and you're yeah. below that so you know it's bad when that's the case it is <laughs> yeah uh, well let's hope that uh again we've seen we've seen the capability with lane thomas uh and let's hope he finds it again yeah. Yeah. i'm not asking him to uh, set the pace for the, the the lineup kenny with the bet but hit 250 yo give me 250 Right. And with a little bit of extra base power and, uh, you know, a couple four or five bombs from uh, here to the end of the season. Right. That, right? that would be nice. I mean, yeah. That, I mean, again, not asking him to take over for uh, Jose Ramirez as your number one stick on the team. Just uh, be able to 
especially with runners on base, especially. And get that, well, when you go one for four, one for five, uh, get that base knock with uh, with somebody in scoring position, right? Uh, because that's that's what you've been brought here to do. So uh, I worry about the Guardians offense from time to time, Ken. I don't know about you, but I mean, at, uh, there are times, and, and that's why when we just discuss pitching, is it just me or does it seem like every night it's 3-2, it's 2-1, three, 4-3? Two, two, they don't play a whole, whole lot of games where uh, the offenses go wild, do they? No, they don't. The exception to, to that rule was yesterday, the 9-8 yeah. win over the right. Cubs. They're mostly in the yeah, – 5-4 is a high-scoring game for them. So, it is. Um, right. You know, we'll see. But, hey, John Kenzie Noel, Will Brennan, since he's been uh, – uh, back up here from Columbus, batting right around 500 since he returned. So here's two guys that have been with you all season. Uh, I know they traded for Lane Thomas, but hey, uh, let's play the guys that deserve the ABs that are getting uh, the job done for you. Uh, and I think uh, Stephen Vogt's done a nice job of getting everybody at bats, but now uh, 42 games left. The Twins are going to beat the Royals tonight, so your lead yep. is only three and a half over Minnesota in the AL Central with those 42 games left. Yeah, that's right. You got to keep Minnesota in the rearview mirror, right? Yep. Uh, that that's got to be a must. Got to win this division, and uh, some of these guys we just talked about are going to need to swing the bats effectively for the Guardians to be able to make that happen. All right, Reds. That's going to do it for this edition of the R and R podcast. Uh, we'll do this again uh, pretty much on a weekly basis soon here because the Browns' regular season will get started. So we'll be focusing on uh, some post game stuff uh, with the Browns after every game, as well as keeping on top of things with the Guardians. And before you know it, the Cavaliers' season will start up, and we've got college football to mix into all of that, Red. So uh, we're just getting ready to rock and roll, aren't we? The fall, baby. The fall gets here, and, uh, you know, the leaves start to turn a little bit. Best time of the year as far as I'm concerned, Kenny, for all the reasons you just mentioned. So, yeah, we're going to stay on top of it, and uh, we'll do it each and every week uh, here on our and Hour. Always Sounds good great. being with you, buddy. You know it, brother. Absolutely. And thanks again to Ty Courts, our outstanding producer, and everybody at the Press Play Podcast Network for allowing us to give you the Rega and Rhoda podcast here. And uh, we will look forward to chatting with you and all you trick bag punks out there uh, on a regular basis throughout another football season. <laughs>